just doesn't feel that fast. Well, if I haven't seen a cooler looking family hatchback since, I don't know, the original Renault Megane, this is the new Peugeot 308, and it's a car that Peugeot hopes will offer a bit of je ne sais quoi and tempt people from their SUVs back into the French family hatchback. So sit tight, over the next few minutes, I'm gonna tell you everything you need to know about this new Peugeot 308. We're gonna talk about engines, we're gonna talk about practicality, we're gonna talk about what this car is like to drive. So like, subscribe, and I won't keep you a moment longer. Peugeot's family hatchback story is long and illustrious. There were some less inspiring iterations in the early 2000s, but the brand hopes to be back at its best with this latest 308. It's now based on the same platform as the new Vauxhall Astra and, as usual, will go head-to-head -head with cars like the Volkswagen Golf and Ford Focus. Not the jostling, all-important market it once was, but still with plenty of talented competition. There's a range of petrol, diesel and hybrid powertrains, but crucially, no manual gearboxes. The new 308 is automatic only. Whatever you think of that, you can't argue with the general feeling of quality in here. I reckon if you covered up this badge and you were none the wiser, you could happily and easily mistake this for, say, a BMW 1 Series or an Audi A3. One thing we're not taken with, though, is this driving position. I'm okay, I'm just over six foot tall, but I'm helped by a slightly longer top half. Some people, like Nicola, just can't get on with it. The top of the wheel sometimes obscures the dials and you kind of have to look over rather than through them. It's called iCockpit and it features on all of Peugeot's cars. It's supposed to be safer, but for some people it just doesn't work and it could be a deal breaker, but more on those a little bit later. Otherwise, there are some pretty cool features in here. Some cars get 3D digital dials. They're not essential, but they do give a premium feel, which is in keeping with the rest of the car. This screen here is angled towards the driver, but it's still not the most responsive setup. This touch sensitive panel below the screen here as well is a bit of a mixed bag. The icons, they're nice and big and easy to operate, but the biggest problem actually is that when you're operating the screen up here, sometimes you catch your hand on that panel, so not ideal. But if you can avoid doing that, then all your needs are catered for. You've got Apple CarPlay, Android Auto, everything is in that screen. You also get climate control, alloy wheels, and automatic LED lights. Step up from active through to Allure and Allure Premium, and you'll add things like sat-nav, all-round parking sensors, and wireless phone charging, depending on which one you choose. Top spec GT and GT Premium models get all the bells and whistles. Full specs can be found in our written review at carbuyer.co.uk. Now, I mentioned a little earlier that the 308 is available with petrol, diesel, and plug-in hybrid powertrains, and in about a year or so, as a fully electric model with around 250 miles of range. But for the time being, it's this PureTech 130 that's expected to be the biggest seller. Honestly though, if you can, we'd stump for the cheaper of the two hybrid models. It's not an insignificant price hike, around six and a half grand, but if you're a company car driver, you will pay half the amount in tax. And even on a monthly PCP finance deal, you may find that the difference is smaller than you imagine. This is the entry-level PureTech petrol though. We liked it in the 208, but the added bulk here means it, it's just not the quickest car in the world. It's got 128 brake horsepower, it does 0 to 62 miles an hour in 9.7 seconds, but it really, it just doesn't feel that fast. It's a shame really, because the gearbox, remember this thing is auto only now, it, it shifts smoothly, it shifts quickly. You can even take control using the paddles behind here on the steering wheel. Don't expect many drivers are gonna do that, nor do I expect many drivers to be fiddling with the drive modes either. You don't really need to though, as I just mentioned, the gearbox is pretty slick, and while we did moan about the driving position, this small steering wheel, which is synonymous with the iCockpit setup in every Peugeot, it makes the car feel quite agile, quite darty, and it makes it quite easy to coax the car into a certain line. Feedback in general is very good, and that's good news for the way this car handles as a whole. Grip is good, body control is good, and even on the 18-inch wheels, it doesn't ride too badly either. In short, if you pick the right powertrain, you've got yourself a really well-rounded family hatch. If you're a company car driver and you can't wait for the electric 308 due in 2023, then the hybrids are still worth a look. 
Both offer among the lowest benefit in kind tax ratings of any car in this class, and if you plug them in every day, could return as many as 40 miles on electric power. The petrol car that we have here is cheaper to buy, but there's no prospect to plug it in, and at 43.5 mpg, fuel economy is nothing to write home about. Those covering big miles might want to look at the diesel. It's refined, punchy, and pretty frugal. So, so far, I'd say the Peugeot's got a pretty decent scorecard, but what Peugeot giveth with one hand, it taketh with the other. Boot space, though, on the other hand, it's not too bad. We've got 412 litres, which is about 30 odd litres bigger than a Golf, but still some way off a Skoda Octavia. But be warned, if you go for the hybrid, that shrinks to 361 litres. But if you do want a bit more space, there is an estate which should tick the boxes. And this is what I was referring to. It's a problem with a lot of cars on this platform, the Astra, for example. It's just a bit dark and dingy back here. This really thick C-pillar just makes things feel a little bit claustrophobic. And that's not helped by the fact that these seat backs are so thick. There's not an awful lot of knee room, not an awful lot of headroom. Overall, could be better. Right, that's the main sections ticked off. But if you're considering a 308, what are the deal makers and the deal breakers? The 308 is quite a nice car to drive. The standard petrol engine is perhaps a little breathless, but if you can step up to the hybrid, you'll get more punch and lower running costs. Style is subjective, sure, but the 308 certainly has its own personality. Better still, bucking the trend for black or white, the only standard colour is green. The 308's cabin feels pretty high-end and easily challenges the conventional premium makers for luxury appeal. On the downside, the 308's cabin isn't the most spacious, and if you go for the hybrid, you have to sacrifice some boot space too. We'll add to that that the driving position still won't suit everyone. Make sure you try before you buy. It feels like the 308 started so well, and then as we started to unpick it, it started to come undone in certain areas. It's still a really good car though, and one that plenty of people will really enjoy living with. It's not the most practical, and well, the petrol engine, it's a bit wheezy, it's just not the best fit for this car, but there's still plenty to like, so don't rule it out. If you like this video, then why not check out our review of the Volkswagen Golf or our family cars playlist. Thanks for watching.